finally, tonight's presentation is titled An Abundance of Magnetized Radio Filaments in the Center of the Milky Way Galaxy by Dr. Farad Zaidi. Recent South African meerkat observations of the galactic center has identified hundreds of magnetized radio filaments in the inner 1,000 light years of the galactic center. The morphology of these filaments appears harp-like, fragmented, cometary tail-like, or loop-like structures. In this talk, after a brief history of the VLA discovery of radio filaments from the 1980s, Dr. Zeta will review the evidence for a population of magnetized filaments and discuss their structural details and origin related to a relic of activity from a few million years ago. Dr. Zeta has been a professor of physics and astronomy at Northwestern University for decades. His main research interest is the nucleus of the Milky Way galaxy. Please welcome Dr. Zeta. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your inviting me to come here to tell you about a little bit about the work that we're doing. I've been here before and I've always had a great time, so really appreciate uh, your asking me to come back. Um, the, uh, the topic that I want to talk about today is uh, the nucleus of our galaxy and uh, some recent measurements that we've done, and I'm going to just show you first an iconic image of the uh, nucleus of the galaxy. Um, and this is, uh, this is how radio sky look, looks like when you look at the center of the galaxy. It's only a few degrees across, and you all know that there is actually a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. This is only about 50 microns in size. 50 mic micro seconds, I'm sorry. Micro seconds in size and this is a few degrees. So I've enlarged this black hole image by a factor of uh, 36 million. So this is, a, this is a really tiny, tiny little object at the center of the galaxy, and this is the plane of the galaxy in the radio. In contrast, what you find in the optical part of the spectrum, the image of the galactic center is pretty much completely obscured because there lots of clouds between us and the center of the galaxy. So we can't really see uh, any features, any objects coming from the center of the galaxy. So we're really dealing with visible versus invisible universe. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. And of course, JWST is going to be able to actually see through also and look at the center of the galaxy with no, issue, no problem. So what are we seeing here is, just this is a plane of the galaxy, the black hole is here. You see supernova remnants here. These are remnants of a supernova explosions. A massive star exploded, and you see the remnant of it here. You see star-forming regions associated with Sagittarius B uh, regions. And then you see this, um, these uh, sort of linear structures that are running perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. Uh, so this is called the radio arc, and this is the uh, Sagittarius C filament, and you see a few uh, objects here. And this is what I'm going to be focusing for the next, uh, whatever, uh, 50 minutes or so. So um, let me just give you a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, just a bit of history of uh, how we found these filaments in the 80s and then uh, using basically very large array of radio telescopes, and then more recent measurements uh, are done with Meerkat Radio Observatory in South Africa. This is what I'll be uh, talking about. Um, I know that you're mainly working with optical telescopes. I'm going to be talking a little bit about also radio telescopes, what they do, and what are the issues that we're dealing with as far as uh, radio interference, how signals are received by by uh, radio antennas, and then talk about science, that what these filaments are telling us, and what's the implication. And then also at the end, I'm going to be talking about some really exciting results, um, that we actually see these radio filaments now in external galaxies. They are in clusters of galaxies associated with active galaxies. So this is also very, very hot topic that um, I'm going to be talking about. 
So uh, let me take you back to the 80s uh, when the very large area of radio telescope was commissioned. And this is a picture of 27 telescopes that are synchronized together and they look at the sky. This is a radio interferometry. And uh, I was a graduate student at the time. I went there to observe uh, the center of the galaxy. And in fact, we're, we were looking for something completely different. And these, uh, uh, these commissioning was, uh, was done in the 80s. So nobody you know, really knew exactly how this whole thing works. So we were learning as we, we, we were moving on. And, and it, was, uh, it was a great time because there was a lot of excitement uh, about people actually using a new instrument, the Very Large Area of Radio Telescopes. And this is uh, what we found um, serendipitously. This is a, a filamentary structure that are about 30 parsec or about 100 light years from the center of the galaxy. The, the black hole is called Sagittarius A star and it's running perpendicular to the plane. So why is it really interesting to see this linear structure? Well, these linear structures had not really seen before because most of what we knew at the time was the morphology of radio structures were like supernova remnants, for example, or you could have also uh, H2 regions associated with star formation. And, uh, and it was really a linear structure like this and we knew that these are very energetic particles illuminating these, these structures. So what you really see here is uh, electrons are moving close to the speed of light along the magnetic field lines and they're radiating in the radio. But there was really no object to power these, these particles that are moving close to the speed of light. And that was the mystery of, of, of why um, you can't see any source. Why? There was no black hole, no neutron stars, no objects that can actually power these things to, to very high energy particles. So it was an exciting time because nobody really knew it was a mysterious object that we all tried to really learn something more. And I was, as a graduate student, this was really tremendous for me because out of you know, my first project, all of a sudden I landed on some, something really exciting. And uh, so that really um, led to find you know, lots of collaborators over the years. And I've been very lucky to have, uh, well, let me just tell you a little bit about the discovery. <clears throat> when we went to the VLA to observe the Galactic Center, we um, we found these filaments, these linear structures, and we, and among others, we thought that it's actually an artifact because nobody had seen these things before. So uh, I was actually for quite some time working really hard to get rid of these linear structures, <laughs> thinking that they were, they were not real. And it was really one night that I was sitting in this uh, room which we called Ape's Cage, and there were two TV screens and two terminals. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. And I had just uh, reduced the new data set. And this was a new data set that I had reduced. And I saw exactly the same structures in both side, on both um, TV screens. And this really was um, one of those moments of, uh, you know, light bulb just gets turned on. You have your Rocco moment in your life and just all of a sudden say, yes, I think this is, this is for real. And this was really uh, quite exciting for me and, and I started to um, understand what the nature of these things are. And as a result of this sort of uh, this finding, I really formed a lot of collaborative friendship with uh, lots and lots of people. And these are a list of some of the people that I have worked with over the years and it's uh, sort of really, it's an interface of your intellectual life and also your, your personal life. So these are some of my friends and, uh, and it's really something that I am very uh, proud to actually have 
uh, got to know uh, these people over the years. Some of them are really great friends, and we've been working together for 20, 30, 40 years um, on different topics, including this, uh, these filaments. So let me get back to the uh, science. Uh, let's move 20 years later in the, uh, that we actually found uh, there were a total of something like uh, 80 of these filaments were already um, uh, discovered and it wasn't just a single. So this is the radio arc and these are sort of more filaments that you see uh, spread out throughout the inner thousand light years of the center of the galaxy. And um, so still the mystery even became thicker in terms of just what are, what are these guys doing there? What is really powering these features? And uh, so please, by the way, ask questions. I'd love to actually hear you asking questions. This is, this is something that uh, it's not just, um, you know, I, I, I hope I'm clear enough to uh, respond to some of your questions as well. So let's, uh, let me now move sort of forward for another 20 years or so. This is when the uh, Meerkat Observatory came online, and this was only just a couple of few years ago, two years ago, in 2019. And this telescope is really just uh, it's like the VLA on steroid, uh, 64 telescopes, and they're uh, spread out in a very quiet zone in South Africa, uh, near Cape Town. And so they were, uh, so you can see uh, one individual telescope here, and I'll talk a little bit about why it looks like this. Um, but that was a, a, a really a great telescope to observe the center of the galaxy and was able to really just bring out a lot of really new structures in this, re in this region of the, uh, of the Milky Way. So let me uh, just say a little bit about how radio telescopes work for some of you who are not familiar. Radio uh, telescopes also are very much operate more like an optical telescope. You have a big dish, it collects photons, the radiation comes from the sky, gets reflected off an aluminum dish, and it goes into a secondary, and from the secondary it goes into the receiver room, and that's where the amplification is done. So this is, these are the leg supports, the secondary mirror here, for example, and this is the primary. Uh, so these, these leg supports obscure some of the radiation that comes from the sky. And that's always been a problem because it adds noise to the, to the images that you're trying to, um, to make, to construct. And, but more recently, so when you look at the look at Meerkat telescope and more recent uh, telescopes that have been constructed, you can see there is no uh, support leg. So what you're really finding is that instead of having a parabolo, parabolic structure, like a mirror, you have now a spherical mirror. And a spherical mirror, and it's offset to a, a secondary that is offset from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the primary itself. So in other words, you have an offset telescope. And the advantage of this type of telescope is that you don't really have any obscuration by the leg support. The same way that also optical folks do it, because you have a spherical sh a sort of mirror, and then it's a convex and a concave mirror, and you send it and so that you can actually get a better image without any obscuration by the leg support. So it's very similar to what optical people do as well. And um, the advantage that you have with radio is that, uh, so, this is another picture showing, showing what this uh, telescope has done. Just a montage of, a, of an a image of the center of the galaxy. And you can see this a huge shell-like structure showing up now for the first time. This is, we think that it's a relic of a, of a past activity by the, by the black hole at the center of the galaxy about a few million years ago. But you can see a better picture of these uh, Meerkat telescopes that are uh, sort of offset axis 
is, is allowing to really get a much better sensitivity than when you have a leg support. So this is one uh, big, big advantage that, uh, that these, uh, these new telescopes have. So how does it really work once you have the secondary sends the signals back into a horn antenna? So there's a little, at the center of this big, big dish, there's this little horn antenna here. The radiation just gets funneled through this little um, uh, horn and, and the radiation, radio waves basically uh, propagate as they get funneled through this horn and there is an antenna here. This antenna is only maybe a couple of centimeters. It's amazing when you think about it that you have a 100 meter dish is really collecting photons and all you really need at heart of a telescope is this little antenna. It's only a couple of centimeters and it receives the radiation and it drives a current and this current just gets amplified and then you can do all kinds of really interesting things with it. Radio has this ability to not only collect the amplitude of the radiation but also the phase of the radiation. So in other words, you can manipulate electromagnetic waves in such a way that it, it is advantageous to, to you, whereas in optical or any other wavelength bands, you can't really do that. You have a CCD, the radiation comes in, you basically see the amplitudes. It's hard to really do, um, well, it's impossible, let me put it this way, it's impossible to, to do this because of complication related to quantum noise that optical wavelengths cannot really, uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, preserve the phase and amplitudes of the signals that you see uh, and so that you can manipulate them and, and, uh, and get uh, to your advantage. So this is basically a quick overview of how radio telescopes uh, work, uh, radio interferometry works, and uh, now let me get back to, uh, oh, well, maybe just a little bit about uh, radio telescopes. So a lot of radio telescopes now um, are suffering from uh, radio interference. So there are three types of interference. Um, one is geolocation satellites. These are really the most dominant of all, uh, all radio interference, or RFI. <laughs> These are uh, satellites, as you all know, GPS, Galileo, Iridium satellites. These are all basically everywhere around in the sky. So it doesn't matter whether your radio telescope is in, a, is in the middle of a desert or whether it's in New York City or Chicago, because you get them. You get them no matter how, where you, you, you have your telescope. Aircraft transponders are also uh, creating also noise. Um, and mobile communication uh, is, is, is a third uh, source of uh, uh, interference. So it's probably better not to build your telescope near an airport here, for example, or near big cities. So these are the two advantages that you have for a telescope that is a little bit away from big cities. But you cannot hide from these, uh, uh, these satellites. And things are getting, I mean, optical folks also have the same issue, um, it's getting uh, worse and worse, but there are some protected bands also that radio people uh, uh, have for their own science. Okay, before I talk about science, any questions? So yes? When you have uh, all these dish separate dishes, do you, uh, you do want to coordinate them to get to make it act as if it was one really giant? Exactly, exactly, okay. absolutely, that's right. So, yeah. So if you have this big dish and all the waves go through the air and they hit the wire a couple centimeters, yeah. how do you actually make an image out of that? Well, um, so, but you have only, this is one telescope, but you have 63 other telescopes doing the same things. So you actually can create an image by having these, when you basically 
process all these signals from each of them and you create basically an image. So this is, uh, goes into what is known as Fourier transform. So you basically get a signal. That signal is not necessarily an image. It's not an image, but it basically gives you one data point. But then you have, at any given time, you have uh, 63 other pieces of information as a function of time. And it's constantly being stored. Uh, and as a result, you sort of sample a good, uh, you know, the, the Fourier space essentially. And then you, there's a mathematical t sort of tool that allows you to go from these um, voltages essentially to an image. Okay. So that's how it is. It's, radio astronomy is, is indirect imaging because it works in a sort of more abstract way because you're collecting these voltages and these voltages, these are signals that you have both the phase and amplitude and then you can manipulate them. You can do whatever you want to do with them and that's why you can actually make images afterwards. Uh, optical, it does it differently. It's, it's direct imaging so you get whatever. It's, you have a CCD and that's it. It's, it's all burned out right on, on a CCD. Yeah. Um, the list of satellites that uh, pose interference seem to be somewhat dated. Are you concerned about uh, Starlink and uh, OneWeb and the other mega constellations of satellites? Um, well, yeah, I think people are always worried about. It. There is a there is National Science Foundation has a commission that is specifically um, trying to uh, sort of lower the the uh, radio interference basically by these new satellites. <coughs> But it is commercial companies, as you know, they always want to push. So, but there are there are some rules and regulations also. But interestingly, there are a lot of new algorithms have have been invented, have been uh, really uh, people have come up with in order to um, recover the uh, the signals. So, generally, if you observe with, uh, with these uh, radio telescopes or satellites are observing, you get about 50% of your, uh, your data. So, 50% is just uh, is due to interference. But these algorithms have a way to actually recover about another 20% of it. So, you, altogether, you can have about 70% of all your signals that you get from the signal from the sky uh, recovered. So, so, there's you know, but things get worse and worse. I think that's my that's my prediction because there's there so many uh, so many um, receivers, so many satellites that are are uh, are affecting our our sky. Basically, how view of the, of the sky. Questions? Yes. How small of an object can you see now? How precise are these uh, radio? Telescope. How, how small of an object can you see? Oh, okay. So for MeCat, uh, the resolution is about something like up to about four arc seconds. So this is not a huge, huge telescope. It's all the telescopes are spread out over eight kilometers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the VLA has been around and it extends up to about 27 kilometers per second, and it goes goes to a resolution less than. Uh, and on seconds so easily. Yeah. So as part of that data reduction that you were doing, is that being able to distinguish what is what what may be behind our center of our galaxy? Uh, in other words, data that might be coming from a, a, a source beyond that, it can distinguish that? That it in other words we're sure this signal is coming from because of the shape uh, phase shift information is that? How well, do you the, the, that there are techniques that you're trying to get rid of all the interference due to Earth-based signals. Mm -hmm. So you, whatever you get from the sky, that's okay. It's all just it could come in from the center of the galaxy or behind the center of the galaxy or for God. But this is this is real radio sky mm -hmm. that you're seeing. Uh, so really these algorithms are invented in such a way to get rid of radio interference from satellites and also from, from uh, Earth-based uh, sort of um, contaminants. So that's what it's doing. Okay. But then how do you distinguish what is, you know, 
part of the R galaxy versus the background galaxy? Well, there are ways that you can do, you can find out. So, you know, their, their, their rotation, for example, you can find out how, uh, how fast they're moving. It depends on also if there's an optical counterpart, then you know that it's a foreground object. It, so there are, there are multiple ways, but it is, it's an issue. Uh, sometimes you actually see objects move across the sky, so you can figure out also a, a third dimension, not only in the radial direction, but also in the plane of the sky. So there are many, many ways that you can do, but this is also a problem also. You don't really know some, a lot of sources, you don't really know for sure where they are. Okay, great. Um, so let me now talk about these uh, filaments. I'll talk about their lens, their brightness, their color distribution, and talk about cosmic rays and synchrotron radiation are all tied to the, these filamentary structures. So this is an image that Meerkat produced, uh, a beautiful image at 20 centimeter wavelength of the center of the galaxy. Now we're looking at the center of the galaxy in a plane in this horizontal direction. So remember that I have the images before more like diagonal, but that's how diagonally they look on the plane of the sky. If you have you had a radio eyes, you would go out and you look at the sky, and the center of the galaxy would look like this. But we sh sort of rotated it, and this is the plane of the galaxy. And you can still see supernova remnants. You can see these, these uh, filamentary structures a lot better, and lots of new structures that showed up. Um, so one of the issues that we had was that there's so many uh, faint filaments here that we wanted to uh, identify these and learn these, uh, see how many uh, filaments are there and uh, what their spectrum looks like. So we uh, looked at some of the uh, ideas that uh, solar astronomers have. Solar astronomers also deal with the same issue when there is a, let's say, a solar loop on the surface of the sun. You can see this is fairly active. Uh, region on the surface of the sun, you see these loops, uh, there are hundreds of them. So what they do is that they have a technique to filter these images. So they filter, so that's not a big deal, it's basically you can get rid of, getting rid of all the uh, large scale uh, structures here, see these sort of very fine loop-like structures here. But then, um, if you really want to know what their length distribution <coughs> is, or what their brightness distribution is, they came up with an automated loop tracing algorithm. And you can see that this is not done by hands, it's actually done by computers. It's not a bad one. So we actually uh, borrowed their algorithms and we applied it to our galactic center images. And uh, so this is the image that uh, we uh, got from doing a filtering of the previous image that I showed you. So uh, let me just go back to this and let's see if it actually works. This should merge into, into a filtered image. This is an unfiltered image and then it just goes, the filtered image shows the filaments a lot better. Uh, so you can see uh, lots of filaments here above the plane of the galaxy and below the plane of the galaxy. And now we could also look at these uh, filaments and find what their length distribution is. So this is all done by computers. So we were able to actually identify these individual filaments um, and then we can actually uh, get their coordinates. We can find out what their uh, length scale is, what their brightness is, and this is uh, this is, I think, yeah. okay, well, before I show you uh, the brightness distribution, let me show you some of the morphological structures. So you can see these, um, these filaments come into groups of uh, a few, let's say five, six or so, and it's remarkable to see that how uh, their spacing is equal from each other. They're separated from each other. So we call this the harp uh, filament. And you see another structure here, they're parallel to each other, they're bent, uh, call it bent harp, 
And it's almost like Saturn's rings, except that we're talking about structures that are um, uh, 100 light years. And this is a waterfall. So you can see that these, uh, somehow, they're very organized in many of the filamentary structures. This is something that we didn't know before Meerkat observation. So why is there a spacing between them? What is the, uh, why is it that starts out with the longest filament and then it goes shorter uh, filament and it becomes also brighter? What is really the cause of the uh, bending? And how is this group of uh, filaments here basically are, are uh, formed? So these are some of the questions that come out you can see in other uh, filamentary structures, this is the horseshoe. You can see that one filament all of a sudden breaks up into two. Uh, it's as if there was an obstacle here. And so it's, uh, you see another uh, sort of bent fork structure here that a, 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 a filament breaks up into two <coughs> components parallel to each other. So it's as if there is a stream of material there is a flow along this filament, and it meets a, an obstacle, and then it just goes around the obstacle and forms two, uh, two sub-filaments. On that image, uh, are the white circles radio source, basically a star? Uh, well, that's what we're trying to find out. So we uh -huh. have the positions, we have infrared counterparts to this. Uh, so in other words, the stars have been identified, but we don't really know if they're associated. See, that goes back to this question somebody asked, well, how do you know that these are foreground or background? So that's a problem when you're doing, uh, when your infrared sky has lots and lots of stars. We don't really know, but we are in the process of really learning more about these individual stars, whether it's the stars that are doing the, uh, they're, they're, they're the obstacle. So yes, that's, uh, that's the plan to find out more what these obstacles are. Uh, so you can see this is a feather filament and it shows up also. Another uh, radio source shows up here and breaks up into two parallel components. Same thing called a sausage, but it just breaks up into two. Uh, so I'm not very imaginative when it comes to naming these uh, <laughs> filamentary structures. Okay, so what do we get out of this is that we actually can now do a population study. We have about 1,000 filaments that are showing up, uh, a fact of 10, more than what we had found uh, previously. And uh, we can now actually see how the length of these filaments change. So this is one of the things that we always want to do when you have a population of sources. We want to know what their color is like, what is their length, what's the weight, what, you know, these are the kind of things that are not necessarily telling you a lot of insight about the origin, but you need to have these parameters you have to know these physical parameters so that you can study them globally. So this is telling you that you have a lot of uh, sort of short filaments and uh, not many long filaments. So it makes sense. That that's what usually distribution. You see a lot more, you know, a lot more roaches than elephants, for example. <laughs> and the same thing also for the brightness. The brightness of these, there is a peak here. A lot of them have a peak in their brightnesses, and then they become, uh, the brightest are just dropping off here. It increases, the brightness increases as you go this way, but then the brightness become, drops off, and it's not symmetrical because this is a selection effect, um, because we don't have the sensitivity to see weaker features. So it would be very interesting to see what happens if there are fainter filaments in this region of the sky, uh, but it's just limitations that we have on the sensitivity. It doesn't allow us to see the faintest object. So that's uh, the kind of things that you learn, what, the, uh, what their uh, uh, spectrum looks like um, for any model that is proposed. So another thing you want to know is the color of these features. So when you look at the same image now, we basically observe uh, with Meerkat, 16 channels simultaneously. In fact, each of the channels have 2,024 additional channels. But let's not worry about that. So it's huge amount of compute, computations done. 
So we have these 16 channels are observing, broad channels are observing simultaneously, and they're recording all these signals. So it's as if you're listening to 16 radio sh stations at the same time, and some of them are loud, some of them are, are not, uh, they're, they're, they're not very loud. So this is what this image is telling you, is that some of these filaments have different colors. Colors, in this case, meaning that they have, they're, they're brighter at certain frequency than other frequencies. And so that's, that's what this, uh, from unfiltered images, show up. And then for filtered images, you can do the same thing, and you can see there is a, uh, there is a coloring scheme here, and that tells you something about the energy of the particles. So the ones that are blue, for example, in this image, blue color means that they are uh, relativistic particles that are more aged than the ones that are uh, uh, yellow, for example. So it tells you something interesting by looking at the spectrum of these or the color of these individual filaments, whether which one is more, more older and which one is younger. So that's interesting. So you're learning something about the age of these filaments as well. And you may ask, well, what's really, how is this radiation produced? So we've learned quite a bit about the sort of the big picture of what their color looks like, what their lens distribution, what the brightness is, but what is it actually really radiating uh, at radio wavelength? And so this is one example that I'm showing. There is a, there is a radio filament here vertically going up. Um, and uh, so what we think is, well, this is, this is radiation that is produced as a result of a, uh, electrons gyrating around a magnetic field uh, and moving relativistically. So this is a schematic diagram of what um, talking about. Essentially, you have the magnetic field associated with the filaments goes up and down. This is B here. And these electrons, charged particles, move in a, a, they gyrate around the magnetic field and they go up. And as they do this, they get accelerated and they radiate. So this little uh, green <coughs> that you see here is the radiation that is emitted. But if you have thousands of these electrons they all basically get, uh, uh, get a big uh, uh, emission from all the individual electrons, and that's what we see. This is the radiation from a, uh, from, it's a synchrotron source. So we call it a cut. So in other words, it's a cosmic ray particles that are radiating when they are interacting with the magnetic field, and they're radiating. So this is uh, what the nature of radiation of these filamentary structures are. They're really close, uh, they're, they're moving close to the speed of light. Very, very, um, very high speed. And I guess, you know, it's still not clear how do you accelerate these particles to such energy. So that's a different question that I get back to. But at least we know for sure that these are synchrotron emitting particles. These are cosmic ray particles that are radiating around a magnetic field. and. And, uh, radiate, and we see them at, at uh, 20 centimeter wavelength. So cosmic rays are really a very big part of uh, you know, the, every galaxy uh, because supernova uh, explosions, young supernovae, for example, they generate a lot of cosmic ray particles and they diffuse into the, into the galaxy. That's not only in our own galaxy, but elsewhere, all galaxies. These are protons, electrons, neutrons, you name it, all these heavy uh, atoms that are charged particles that they're moving with very high speed and um, they have, they're very energetic and then they diffuse out. So let's say you have a supernova explosions here in a galaxy. This is a phason galaxy, the Whirlpool galaxy, similar to our Milky Way galaxy and it's uh, these cosmic ray particles diffuse. They don't really go in a straight line. They don't really more, they're not like photons uh, or radiation. They just diffuse uh, throughout the galaxy and eventually sometimes they reach the, uh, the atmosphere of the Earth and they collide with the atmosphere of the Earth. You see these air showers and, and 
So that's what uh, cosmic rays uh, do, and we think that these cosmic rays associated with the filaments are all tied to the magnetic field. They don't, these, these guys are not really being diffusing, uh, so we, the magnetic field is really tying them in such a way that they're da they can't really escape. So this is a spectrum of, the, of cosmic rays in our galaxy. This is one of the most beautiful plot that astronomers and physicists love to see. Uh, this is about 10 to the power of eight uh, orders of magnitude, or eight orders of magnitude. So it starts out with GeV and it goes to EeV. It's eight orders of magnitude in energy of the particles. These are cosmic ray particles. And this is their fluxes, eight orders of magnitude. So we have a very good spectrum of all these particles in our galaxy, in the local neighborhood, these are all measured over the years with lots and lots of satellites. And we know that the energy of density of these cosmic ray particles in the local neighborhood, in the local, uh, local to us, is about one to one and a half EV per centimeter cube. Don't worry about the units, but what's interesting about the center of our galaxy is that it's about 1,000 times more. Um, more energetic than, or energy density is thousand times more than what you see in, uh, in our uh, local neighborhood. So that's one of the unusual aspects of the nuclei of galaxies. They're very active and they, um, they are uh, lots of activities that generate these cosmic ray particles and filaments are really a byproduct of these activities that we don't know yet what it is. Uh, but that's, that's the difference between um, an object in the center of the galaxy versus in, in the local neighborhood, which is in the suburb of the galaxy. So before I, I go to the next chapter, any questions? Yes? You said they're many light years long. How wide are they? How thick is that energy? They, uh, these filaments are about half a parsec in uh, in, in width. So uh, half a parsec is about one and a half light year or so. Okay. So now let me talk about these uh, new population of filaments that uh, have been found. So it's really very exciting for me because one of the issues that uh, people always ask me was that where can you find these filaments? And I could just say, well, only the center of the galaxy. Um, but now, uh, a new population of these filaments found in active galaxies, and I'll show some of these pictures. These are very, very new uh, data. But before I show you these, I want to just tell you what radio sky looks like when it comes to active galaxies. So this is a beautiful radio image of, the, of Hercules A. There is an active galaxy here, an optical. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image superimposed on a radio image. You don't really see any of these features in the, uh, the pink is not showing up at all in, in, in optical, uh, but the optical shows clearly a very nice, very active galaxy here at the center. This is where supermassive black holes lie, and they, uh, they produce activity in such a way that they create two jets of material flowing away from the black hole, and eventually, they hit the intercluster medium, the medium between galaxies, and then there's a backflow. So you can see this more like a, a candy, uh, uh, cotton candy here, but they're basically uh, shocked gas that just uh, stops here and it just overflows uh, backward, basically towards the <coughs> towards the galaxy. So this is a sort of a typical radio galaxy. There are thousands of them in the, in the radio sky, but this is a beautiful example of how radio and optical work um, together in such a way that you have like two parallel universes. They do, they do different things. They show you different things in the, on the sky. So this is uh, a radio galaxy, uh, 3C40b, that is uh, similar to Hercules A, except that it's a little bit more complicated. You see the, this is the, the, the black hole where it is. This is sort of the core of the galaxy. These are two jets that are bent slightly, and then these are the lobes. 
So this is very similar to what I showed you before. This is another radio galaxy. There are two of them. Uh, but these radio galaxies, we know they're redshift from optical measurements. But what is unusual about this is that there are two filamentary structures have been discovered. And these filaments are uh, showing up here, which is most unusual because it's not has nothing to do with the jet. And it's not related to the core of the galaxy, or the black hole. And somehow it just comes off from this, uh, from this direction, away from the direction of the jet. So what I did, this is actually an, another image showing X-ray gas. This is a cluster of galaxies. So what you really find, this galaxy that I showed you is in the middle of 100, probably 100 galaxies that are orbiting in a cluster. They're bound together, clusters of galaxies. Um, you can have rich clusters of galaxies, up to about 1,000 galaxies bound together by their self-gravity. And this, is, uh, this uh, galaxy that I showed you is in, in, a, um, in a cluster of galaxies. So what I did was to show, to display three filaments from the galactic center and one this new filament that is associated with the with a radio galaxy, with an active radio galaxy. And you can see the enormity of these filaments. They are, we're talking about, they're up to about 300 kiloparsec in length. They're over one million light year in distance. And the galactic center was about 28 parsecs. So you may so it's really amazing when you look at it. I, I, I ha have a tough time just to say which one is extra galactic and which one is uh, in our center of the galaxy. And yet their distances are remarkably different from each other. But it turns out that it has nothing to do with the distance, the length of these filaments. It's more the ratios. The length to width of these filaments are the same for both the galactic center and the ones that you see in extragalactic sources. This is another uh, radio galaxy, unfortunately got distorted, um, but the, the black hole is sitting here. You see a radio jet is going in opposite direction. This is the lobe, this is another lobe. What you find is these filaments that are showing up, uh, sort of cometary structures. And the morphology is very similar, uh, so I, Sort of, I'm showing these two images next to each other. This is the nucleus of the black hole at this, uh, this galaxy, and you see the jets coming off. And this is these, uh, these new uh, filaments that are parallel to each other. They're synchrotron radiation, they're magnetized, they're, you know, they have all the characteristics that we find in the center of our own galaxy. And here is uh, at the center of the galaxy. Uh, three filaments that we call the comet tail. So the idea, you can see again, the distances are thousand times, not distances, I'm sorry, the lengths of these guys are different by a factor of thousand to ten thousand. Um, this is another galaxy that shows a radio galaxy as part of a cluster of galaxies orbiting around the center of the cluster this is where the black hole is. You see two radio jets. There is a flow coming from the, from the black hole itself. And then all of a sudden, these new filaments, very faint filaments, are showing up in, uh, in this direction. So nobody had predicted, nobody had really seen. These are all measurements that have been done with Meerkat Observatory. And this is just another comparison between what we see in our galactic center versus what we see in, in the uh, nuclear of these active galaxies. So it's a five parsec, 100 kiloparsec. So it's, it's huge. Um, and this is another one that the filament breaks up. So the point is that now these filamentary structures are now found in elsewhere. And now we can learn from each other by looking at the big picture uh, compared to what we see in the center of the galaxy. And let me just. Uh, one, this is one last item that I want to talk about, but any questions before I go on? Is, is this the speculation part we're coming to, like the source of these moments, like black holes, white holes, dark matter? Uh, yeah, them? just be patient. Yeah, that's okay. my next <laughs> <session>. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Any other questions? I have sort, okay. sort of an odd question. Um, I assume that this material that we're seeing accelerating this way, there really isn't much there mass-wise. We're not talking about huge, like notable percentages of the mass of a galaxy or something, rather that's associated in these filaments and things, are we? Or, uh, no, no. The, the galaxy, in fact, clusters of galaxies, most of the mass is actually in the gas. Right. It's, it's the gas and dark matter. Mm -hmm. So stars really contribute very few. It's mm -hmm. only like a few percent. And then you have 20 to 30 percent of these clusters, the gas that's associated with X-rays, for example. And then dark matter takes up the rest of it. And so but the these filaments are not really, they don't, they don't really contribute much no. to the mass. No. But they contribute, I think they're, I calculated these filaments are, their luminosity is about something like 10 to the power of 10 million times more luminous than the sun itself. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is an extragalactic ones are huge. I mm -hmm. mean, you can imagine that they're kiloparsec in width rather than being half a parsec in width. So it's really, um, but, but there are some, you know, so this is very new. It's only less than 10 of these filaments have been discovered yet. Uh, but I think there are, there are ways to uh, try to explore the commonality between these two populations of filaments. Um, and this is one idea that we had for the Galactic Center, is that if you have an obstacle, for example, and there is a, we know that there is a cosmic uh, driven, uh, there is a wind in the center of the galaxy, and these winds interacting with, a, with, with an object that is moving, and this wind is magnetized, and it wraps around the obstacle and produces a tail. This is really similar to cometary tails that you find for comets, for example. The solar wind, for example, comes in and uh, interacts with the, with, with the comet and, and creates a tail behind it. Sort of, we know now, the cometary tail uh, picture that we're talking about, this is a picture that I'm talking about. There is an obstacle here. We think it's associated with these filaments, but we don't really know for sure. We're doing some more measurements to figure out whether this is just an uh, a superposition, uh, an object that is not related or related. So the idea is that if this object is related, the wind just drapes around this object and the magnetic field becomes stronger and then it, since the object is moving in certain direction, then it creates a tail behind it, very similar to a comet or similar to also the Earth, is constantly bombarded by the wind coming from the sun and it just creates basically this sort of a uh, shaped, uh, uh, cometary shaped structure behind also even planets themselves. So that's a model, cometary model that we have. And, and it's not really crazy because this is a star that is in only a few kiloparsecs away from us. It's a minor variable star. In this case, this star is not really moving fast about actually it is moving fast at about 200 or 300 kilometers per second. And the medium, interstellar medium, it just gets basically uh, wraps around this object and produces a tail behind it. So it's a different frame of mind. Here, it's the object that is moving through a medium, whereas in the case of the galactic center, it's the medium that is moving through and wraps around these individual sources because we have a a wind, a powerful wind at the center of the galaxy. So, and this is also simulations show that if you have a wind and you have a cloud here and you create these cometary structures behind the cloud. And of course, eventually the cloud dissipates um, after a while. But you do create filamentary structures as a result of a wind wrapping around an object and then creating a tail behind it in the direction away from the motion of the object itself. So, so what we think is happening is that this wind is really a result of a, an explosive activity at the center of the galaxy a few million years ago because all the filaments that we see, most of the filaments that we see in the center of the galaxy, or close to about a thousand of them, are 
basically confined by this uh, big um, uh, uh, bubble, this uh, radio bubble that we see, it really has to be created by something that is pushing it, and that's usually uh, connected to uh, activities associated with uh, massive black holes. That's one of, generally. Uh, so what about extragalactic sources? So what we think is happening for extragalactic is active galaxies. What you have is a, again, a black hole here. And this black hole has a very powerful jet that is coming off in two directions, opposite directions. But then, as you notice, some of these filaments basically break up. And this is called the kelvin helmholtz instability. kelvin helmholtz instability. I had a simulation on my, <laughs> on my laptop. Uh, that would show what Kelvin helmholtz instability is. The instability is very simple. It's essentially if you have an object that is moving through a medium, but the medium has a different speed compared to the object itself, then you, get, you create this instability. So as long as you have a different speed of an object with respect to the motion, uh, let's say flag instability is an, a, an example. Flags, basically you see they, they a flop, and that's an instability. As long as you have some wind direction and the flow uh, being having a different value, so you get you get you get this sort of buckling of the of the jet is happening because of this instability. So what happens is that these particles here are very loosely bound. So we think what what's happening here is that it's the galaxy is moving through a through a, a, a center of the cluster. You remember these are clusters of galaxies. And they all rotate around the center of the cluster. So what you um, see is that these, it's, it's as if there is a wind is created. So you put yourself in the frame of this uh, jet here when it's become unstable. What it really sees is that the wind is blowing against it because the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, radio galaxy is moving through. So as a result, the material gets stripped off and it's loosely bound features and creates this filamentary structure. So this is what we think is happening. Um, it's not obviously unique. This is one picture that we have uh, that may actually uh, sort of show similar, similar picture to what we see in the center of the galaxy. In the center of the galaxy, we already have a wind there there is no rotation, there is no radio lobes, there is no activity there. It's a different, but it's a cometary model that I use to explain this, so the ones in the galactic center can also be applied to this picture as well. Question. Is this your explanation for the Fermi bubbles that have been discovered on either side of the black hole? The, uh, the picture that I showed you, this is actually a scaled down version of a Fermi bubble. So this is, uh, this is a little bit younger than the Fermi bubble. Fermi bubble is much bigger, much more powerful. So that may have actually been a, a product of another event, more powerful event by the, center of the, by, the, by the black hole at the center of the galaxy. But the fact, you know, the interesting thing is that if we tie these, to the filaments, then it says something interesting about the origin of the filaments themselves related to the, to the activity of the center of the galaxy, or the black hole itself. So anyways, so I think this is all new um, for us. This is uh, the, the, the connection between extragalactic filaments and also filaments at the center of the galaxy is fairly new, but I think we are learning quite a bit because we have a population here, we've studied it for over 20, 30 years, and now these new uh, filaments are showing up in external galaxies, and nobody knows exactly how, how these new phenomena in external galaxies are produced. And we're learning some interesting things from those measurements. We see sort of the, the forest, and uh, here we see the, the trees here. So, Hopefully, we'll have a better picture of what's going on in both uh, cases. But what is really interesting about this is that there is a commonality in the physical picture that we see, the physical parameters of these filaments that exist in our center of the galaxy and, and the ones near in, in active galaxies. So that's, 
really the message that I wanted to, uh, um, to, to drive here. So there are some questions. Yes, go okay. ahead. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? So I think what you said is that if the thing is rotating um, counterclockwise, <coughs> then the filaments are created basically from the, uh, the black lines. Yes. W wouldn't that imply that all the filaments would be, in this case, uh, below the lines? You know, versus on, on both sides of the lines? Yeah. You mean for filaments that are yeah, elsewhere? Yeah. Well, so your filament in red is below what yes, I call below yes, the yes, line. Yes, yes, yes. Um, because the, the, all the black stuff is rotating counterclockwise. That's right. Um, but I thought in some of your pictures you had filaments that were below and above the, um, the streams. Well, for external galaxies, we're talking about yeah. the limited number. Uh, I can go back. Um, some of them, uh, this one, for example, remember, it's not, a, this is this is the most complicated one because it's coming from one lobe to the next. So the wind is not necessarily really coming from, uh, it's somehow affecting the lobes, and it's basically pushing it. This is, this is, this is a very complicated one. So I don't know how this works. We don't really know how this thing is rotating, so it's a bit difficult. But the wind, if if you ask me, the wind in this picture has to come from this side, so that it runs into an obstacle here, and this is where the instability is, or the or cosmic rays are fairly loose, and then they bring, basically bring them back from from one end to another end. So that's the picture that we have. This is the more, most complicated one, but there are uh, simpler ones, I think, that, that work in the same picture that we talk about. Yeah, so question. What is causing the wind between these, uh, in the intergalactic medium? Yeah, intergalactic medium, uh, especially when you have clusters of galaxies, they all have this enormous X-ray gas in there. So this is, uh, you know, you've heard about cooling flows, for example. Most of the mass of the you know, baryons, most of the mass is actually in the form of gas, not stars. Right. So the galaxy itself doesn't have a lot of mass, but it's amazing, these, these x-rays. So the x-rays are sitting there, and this thing is moving through. So then it creates a wind if you're in the frame of a reference of the of, of the jet or the radio galaxy itself. And if it's loosely bound, then this wind is stripping off and creating this, this material. So it's exactly similar to the cometary picture that we have. You have an obstacle and a wind is coming and creates a, 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 a comet behind, cometary tail behind it. So it's basically the same picture that we're applying to both the center of the galaxy and also the, the nuclear of galaxies. But, but I guess I'm asking in, in, in the commentary example, right? Yes. It's the sun that's creating that wind. Yes. But in, in between galaxies, what is the source of the wind? Well, the source of the wind is, is, is that you're moving it? through it. Yeah. Yeah. it it's okay. not. It's not a wind. It's not like the galactic center that has a wind. Yeah. We know that, but not. Not this one is a sort of a depending on which reference frame you're, you're in. Okay. Yeah. And that's the reference. That, frame. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Good. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So really, I think he was. I just wanted to say that we got a lot of coverage on these radio filaments, even though we just said that we don't really know how this thing works. People were inspired. Um, some nice pictures and there are some YouTube pictures that I cannot really, I don't know whether it works, let's see.
all the lamps have been put out, and now the night is hushed and clear, and all the memories of vanished days return and reappear, and tender legends flit about like gleams amid the blue, until with sad and wondrous joy the heart remembers to I have this on YouTube, so he can always <laughs> do it. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but uh, basically, anyways, there were a lot of people, like over 7 million people really downloaded some of these <laughs> uh, press releases. I, I'm just baffled. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just showing that how people really are excited about things that are mysterious. We really just said that we don't really know exactly how it works. But this is what we see. Uh, people really like this idea, and, and I think it's probably just the shape and the structures and whatnot. And then I think it's maybe Einstein had it when he said, that, you know, the most beautiful experience we have is the mysterious, is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. I think that's what people were probably attracted to that these filaments are mysterious rather than we just coming in and just say that we know exactly everything about them. So I think that probably was the reason. Um, but I think I just put my summary um, page here and I want to thank you again for for inviting me and it's, um, it's nice to see you in the new place. I had to really watch out my words here <laughs> because of <laughs> because of where we are. <laughs> so I could do <laughs> I could use some of the words in the other place, but not not here. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, thank you again for for having me. Yes. Are the filaments always perpendicular to the general motion of the, the galaxy? The the plane of the, the in our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we always thought that they were perpendicular, but new images actually show they're not. You see the hook-shaped structures, you see they're, they're all kinds of ways that they show up also. But but predominant component of the filaments is actually running perpendicular <coughs> to the galactic plane, and that is because we have a wind that is coming from the plane of the galaxy and pushes them in the direction away from the plane, Whereas that is not so when it comes to, to external galaxies. So there are differences. But, but I'm saying the, gen, the general motion, if, if the galaxy is going this way, the entire galaxy is going this way, it, are the jets going to be going that way? Are they? Yes, jets bend. There are lots and lots of galaxies that have bend jets. Uh, these are called uh, uh, sort of head tail radio galaxies, because as they move through the galaxy, you see them, they bend quite a bit. To the extent that when they are very old and they're rotating fast, they become a single tail. So you see only the radio galaxy and you see a double tail. So there are wide angle tail, there are narrow angle tail. The morphology is tremendous. There are lots and lots of beautiful morphological shapes of radio galaxies in clusters. Are a lot of these images online that are available to the public or not? Uh, well, now I guess you have them. It's all with you take. Once <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, no, these are all published. The ones, the external, the comparison that I made between the filaments, um, between our galactic center and the external galaxies, is really new, very new. It's not published yet, and it's submitted. So that's that's. So you got the fresh, so sort of fresh view of what uh, what we think is happening. But um, but those radio galaxy filaments are all published, though. So there's nothing nothing um, unusual about them. So that's yeah. But if you have any questions, you need some images. Let me know. I'd be happy to give it to you the direction or whatever. Yes. Is um, filaments luminous enough in visible wavelengths to be seen from here if there were no dust and gas? Uh, in the no, these are different kinds of beasts. They're synchrotron radiation, 
When they're young, you could see them in the optical wavelengths. But in optical wavelengths, electrons lose energy rapidly. Remember, photons in the optical, they're very energetic. It's like x-rays. They're very energetic, and they're, they have a lifetime. Their lifetime is very short, and they die. You don't see them. But then radio is really just a, it's a relic of, you know, it just doesn't lose a lot of energy. And it can go on for billions of years. That's why radio sky is so rich, because they're, they're so old, and they don't really lose all of their energies, and you can see them in the sky. And the same thing for filaments. These filaments are old enough that they may have had optical, for sure, um, but, but not now. They're, they're too old to, for, for that to really survive. Every, every electron in a synchrotron radiation has a certain lifetime. The lifetime depends on the energy of the photons. If the photon energy is very high, it has a very short lifetime. If it's the energy of the photon is really low, it just really stays and just moves on for a long, long time. So these are all, we're talking about, um, these filaments are 100 million years old, some of them. They can be, the one external galaxies. The ones in our galaxy, they're only a few million years old. Uh, but the ones that are in external galaxies, they're, they're much older. So there are uh, differences between these two populations. Thank you. Any other questions? So yeah. would um, uh, there be filaments in our local group, like between the Milky Way and Andromeda, as there are with other galaxies? I mean, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting. Nobody has done this type of very fantastic measurements with Meerkat. Meerkat is really just beginning to uh, look at the sky uh, with detail. So, but I think what we've seen, they're associated with active galaxies. So if there are active galaxies in our local group of galaxies, then possible. <coughs> OK, great. Oh, one last question. Are you able to say, uh, it's truly to say, what impact on the research and the filaments of uh, the James Webb telescope might be uh, in taking in what direction that is? Yes, yes. That's a good, yeah. Lots of good questions, but this is another one. Um, James Webb can actually tell us what these obstacles are. These obstacles that I mentioned before, we don't really know what they are, but if they are stellar sources, for example, then they should be visible. They should be visible in, uh, certainly in with JWST. So that's one of the plans, one of the plans I have, actually, to write a proposal to search for what are these sources, what these sources are. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much again. You have a good day.